<laughs> all right, let's get started. Um, the first thing I'd like us all to do is introduce ourselves. I think that's a good way to start most things. Um, so Sarah, you're at the top of my screen. Would you mind telling us and the listeners who you are, what you do, and the fictional worlds that you're inhabiting right now? So books you're reading, uh, like TV or games, whatever. Sounds good, yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah McAnulty. I am a squid biologist and the executive director of a nonprofit called Skype a Scientist that is uh, basically aiming to match up scientists with as many people as humanly possible to get people talking with scientists. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a science communicator basically and I help other scientists do that as well. Um, the fictional world I'm living in, uh, Animal Crossing is probably the world I'm living in the most. Uh, <laughs> It's a sad, stressful world out there, so I'd rather be just like picking peaches or whatever. Uh, I just finished a sci-fi book yesterday by Blake Crouch called Recursion, which is all about like memory and time travel and cool stuff. Um, I just finished that yesterday, so I'm not living there anymore. Um, and, I, and I'm usually watching The Good Place like in the background all the time. So yeah, that's where I'm living. That sounds awesome. I'd love to be living there too. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia, what about you? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Cecilia O'Leary, and I am, I guess I'm kind of a mix of an oceanographer and a fisheries biologist. Um, I'll study anything that's on large scale in the ocean, basically, um, and that also involves climate. Uh, and in terms of fictional worlds I'm in, uh, I'm always in the fictional world of Schitt's Creek. That is my number one favorite show, and if you follow me on Twitter at all, you'll know that I'm constantly putting uh, Schitt's Creek gifts. Um, and I'm actually also reading a book, I forget what it's called right now, but it's on, um, it's not really a fictional world, it's actually about a woman who's on one of the mountain rescue teams in Seattle, and she writes about each of the different mountain rescues that she goes on, uh, and I'm sure about halfway through the podcast, I'll remember the name, the title of the book, but yeah, those are the worlds I'm in. Oh, that sounds so interesting, and I, I can, you know, later edit in, um, like, <laughs> when I remember the or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Kate, what about you? Yeah, I'm Kate Downey. I am the co-founder and creative director of Caveat, uh, which up until March was a live events venue in the Lower East Side uh, in New York. Um, now we are on the internet and we do live streams six night nights a week. Um, but yeah, Caveat puts on a ton of shows pretty much every night of the week uh, and every single show will make you a little bit smarter and a little bit drunker. Sometimes it's comedy about neur neuroscience. Sometimes it's drag shows about sea creatures, uh, <laughs> like we have coming up with Sarah. Um, and sometimes it's um, comedy about political science and circus. <laughs> so we do a ton of different stuff, uh, but it's all about um, making entertainment out of information. Yeah. Uh, and fictional, fictional worlds I'm inhabiting are, uh, currently I just finished, um, the Great, the first season of The Great on Hulu, which was aggressively marketed to me on Instagram, and <laughs> they were correct. I <laughs> loved it. <laughs> um, it's Catherine the Great, uh, like oh. early days of her kind of coming to Russia, and like she's like nineteen and figuring it out, and it's like L uh, L Fanning, oh, mm -hmm. and it's just it's like um, everything is is beautiful and and like uh, it's very like Versailles. Uh, everyone's wearing beautiful clothes, but it, but they're talking in a very contemporary way. So it's like what I thought the favorite was going to be, and it was not. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, I didn't know this about you ahead of time, but you liking period TV shows just really fits in with what I already knew about you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I don't like Siri. I don't like ones that take themselves very seriously, mm -hmm. but I love any period piece that like has a sense of humor and like plays with it. Um, and they like, yeah, they, I love the way that they talk in this. It's, it's all, it's like contemporary, but they all have like great accents. Um, <laughs> but they're all going like, fuck you. <laughs> That's great. It's amazing. Awesome. Um, and I will post links to all of the stuff that our guests are doing down in the description of the video and the podcast. So you can definitely follow them there. Uh, but now let's move on to building our world. Uh, so whenever I build a world, I always answer questions in the same order. And that order is intentional because I think that this is the order that just makes sense if you're using logic to create a world. So first I start imagining the environment, like what's the climate, the geography, the physical setting like. 
Uh, and then I start thinking about biology, which depends directly on your physical environment. Uh, biologists, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and then I delve into culture, which is the biggest chunk because there's so much to it, uh, but that will depend directly on your biology and your environment. So that's the, the order that I do things in. Uh, and I have picked a setting for our world. Um, the guests know what the setting is and uh, viewers and listeners, you might be able to guess what the setting is based on the expertise of the guests I've invited. Uh, uh, a couple marine biologists and oceanographer and someone whose Twitter handle used to be wrong whale. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the world where imagining today is not actually a planet at all. This is my first non-planet, but it's a moon. And there are a couple of moons in our solar system that astronomers think might have a good chance of hosting life. Uh, these are Enceladus and Europa. They're icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter, respectively. Uh, and they have these icy shells on the outside, but underneath uh, there are liquid oceans. And astronomers think that there's a good chance that they are liquid water oceans which is very exciting for life. Um, if you're wondering how the heat gets in there, uh, there are a couple of different mechanisms. The most common is that uh, the other moons that are orbiting the planet and the planet itself will pool on this moon, uh, Europa or Enceladus, and that will create friction uh, through gravitational and tidal forces. And that friction creates heat, which actually means that you can have a liquid water uh, ocean underneath an icy surface. So that's our world. Um, another consequence of it being a moon instead of a planet is that it's really far away from the sun. So there aren't natural uh, sources of, of light as powerful as the sun. Uh, and we can get into how that would affect our life forms later on in the show. Uh, but first, I have a question that I think just shows how little I know about oceans. Why are there currents on, in our oceans and would there be currents in this world, in this subsurface ocean, where there's no wind? Well, I can definitely take that I think question. Cecilia is going to be the best one to answer this one, for sure. That is a super good question. Um, and there's a couple different reasons that we have currents. Um, the simplest of those are there's wind-based currents. So the wind is pushing the surface water. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the thermohaline circulation, which is the fact that we have different temperatures and different densities of seawater due to the salt content. Mm -hmm. um, and so that pushes the water around. Uh, and so there's a, a, bunch of, a bunch of things that might happen in this world with the currents, which is totally the first thing that I wanted to talk about. We're going to have to like basically reconstruct currents um, because those reasons that currents happen might still exist, depending on how thick this ice is and whether there's any breaks in it, so we can mm -hmm. still get wind currents. But also one of the things that uh, directs the currents that are on Earth are, is the existence of land, right? So anywhere that the currents go, they're often redirected by land, and there's a lot of physics involved in that, but basically if there's land, it can't keep going through it, right? And also the land prevents, um, super, super large waves and stuff from happening because you can't get as much, there's not as much space for the land or for the wind to be blowing those waves across. So um, I think one of the first things that we would have to figure out about our planet is um, sort of like where is salt going to come from? Because there's a bunch of different places where salt comes from on Earth that wouldn't necessarily happen on this planet. Um, and how thick is our ice going to be? How much is this temperature changing? Um, and then we can answer the rest of the current question. Great. Um, so these moons have rocky solid cores um, and astronomers think that there is like a, almost like a liquid mantle core uh, in either Europa or Enceladus, I don't remember. Uh, and so they, they have cores very similar to Earth, but then it's just a very deep ocean, uh, something like maybe 10 kilometers deep. Uh, and then there's a very thick, shell of ice uh, many kilometers deep. Okay. So that's, that's the world we're going for. There are salts that will just exist because those are the compounds that were around when this moon formed. Uh, and so there will be salts in the core, in the ice. Um, the salts in the ice will lead to very interesting, not plate tectonics, but like subduction of uh, the ice sheets. So that's what we're working with. 
cool. Yeah, so I think it's going to be like everything will be kind of almost turned over coming from like the bottom up because we're not going to have um, sort of like weathering and precipitation is a lot of where we get the salts in our ocean from. And then we also have um, sort of new water that forms at the surface that we think about it. When water comes up to the surface of the ocean, it's sort of like re-energizing what, what oxygen and nutrients and temperature and all that. Um, and so our, our thermohaline circulation, which is driven by the salt content and the heat content, will be start from sort of the bottom up because that's where we're getting our heat from. And so that will be what drives the density differences that happen in our ocean current. So I think that's the biggest thing. And then the other thing to think about too is if we have this really thick sheet of ice at the top, that means that our, um, our water won't get the chance to interact with the atmosphere. So it's not gonna change temperatures there. It's not gonna get any oxygen or other gases from uh, the surface. It's not gonna get any nutrients unless there's something frozen in the ice. So that will, that will be what happens with the ocean currents. Amazing. Uh so here on earth we have different regions there's like mountain regions and forests and ocean and desert i'm wondering if there would be a similar division of regions that could happen in this ocean and would that depend on salt content or density or temperature or, or like how would you envision that taking place well i think what we have in the ocean instead of having these different biomes kind of all over the place like we do on land you have that but it's all about depth and the amount of light uh, and the amount of pressure that you have. So mm. there's more biodiversity on land on earth um, because there's just more, uh, more stuff happening in terms of different kinds of environments. And on, in the ocean, um, it's really more about, yeah, how much light do you have? How much pressure do you have? Um, and in some cases, you might have some, a little extra uh, thing here and there, like the hydrothermal vents, which I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, mm. later. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, the question is, is any light getting through that ice? Probably not. So I think you're going to have a much more uniform situation uh, on this planet than you would typically have uh, when we think about Earth. But could you still have um, like valleys, like once you get to where kind of the, the rocky core starts, could you still have mountain ranges and valleys and would the like water environment there be significantly different at like the top of a undersea mountain than at the bottom of an undersea valley mm, great I question so. yeah i yeah for sure. i don't know how mountainous the rocky surface at the core would be but a lot of study or some studies have been done about these uh kind of the subduction or this like almost plate tectonic movement of the ice shelf and that could mean that there are like upside down ice mountains near the top. And that would be really exciting. Well, I think, to wouldn't, wouldn't that end up being like if everything is kind of flipped around and there's like more stuff happening towards the core in terms of like temperature and uh, yeah, more stuff um, <laughs> would, would uh, like upside down ice mountains near the surface kind of be like the bottom of the ocean for us because it's like the fur further away from like the source of heat and Ooh. like nutrients possibly i think in this system for sure because so one of the things that is sort of like the primary driver of where stuff is in the ocean is the nutrient levels and the light levels right and so if we're basically getting rid of light it sounds like then we won't necessarily have the same productivity zones at the surface and so in addition to restructuring the currents, we're also restructuring the entire ocean food web because we're not gonna have most of it, it's, same, it's the same as land. So we have primarily on the top of photosynthetic based food web, right? So we have all the algaes and stuff that use light and nutrients to produce energy um, and also oxygen. So if we, get, we have to get rid of all that, um, that means that that uh, life that's usually on the top that most of the larger things eat and also that life that's on the top, when it dies, it falls and feeds other stuff in the ocean, that's gone. So it, I almost kind of envision the top being like a, a desert of sorts. Mm. Um, and we don't have that, uh, that feeding of uh, carbon life on the top down to the bottom. So the only carbon life there's gonna be will be these extremophiles that we have in the bottom from the heat source. Um, so that's what I see in my mind, at least. Awesome. 
Sarah, do you have any thoughts to add? I completely agree. I mean, I think the the blooms of life are going to come from these chemical sources like hydrothermal vents like we have um, on Earth. So we might get bigger animals, but the source is totally flip-flopped. Yeah, exactly, like others said. Yes. All right. So I, I love that we've we've thought about like where the source of energy and nutrients is going to be coming from, because that will help us decide uh, where our dominant life forms live or like where, where all of our life forms live. Um, so let's move on to biology. Let's think about what those life forms actually look like. What types of physical traits and characteristics do you think a species would have to have to claw their way to the top of the food chain or like, like thin their way to the top of the food chain, whatever, <laughs> whatever it may be. Sure. Well, I think first of all, uh, one thing about humans is that we tend to like project our own ways of getting through the world on other animals. And I think we got to throw <laughs> that right out the window because we are visual creatures. Like we rely on vision for a lot. And if we're living in a completely dark place, the way we see is not going to be how these animals get around. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to need to be really good smellers. They may also need to have some kind of uh, way to sense movements and anywhere around them. And maybe they are seeing things different from us. Like we know that snakes are using uh, heat pits on their faces to sense basically the, the heat of their prey. Um, I don't know there's if our fish that. that do I did not too. know that. <laughs> fish do that too. Great. Yeah, there's so, some fish like rat tails that have these little uh, sensory pits for odor. That's what I'm talking about. So maybe we're going to have uh, animals with lots of pits on their face to sense instead of the eyes. Uh, maybe that's how they're seeing who's around, what's happening uh, in their environment. Also, maybe uh, echolocation may be important. Yeah, because sound travels faster in water. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we can switch everything, right? So we can have visuals, but we could also just completely switch. We don't, yep. we can talk about visuals when we get to squid, obviously, but uh, <laughs> you could, you know, mimic like a marine mammal world or a fish world, which is mostly auditory. Um, and everything that they do is making different noises at different frequencies. Um, and sound travels much further too. So you can have uh, longer distance communication, which we might need if our existence is dependent on um, hydrothermal vents, which would be scattered. They wouldn't be connected necessarily. Right. Nice. Uh, fun fact about me, I fell asleep to whale songs all throughout high school. Really? Yes. <laughs> They're very calming. They They're work. so soothing. I love them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I love that we started talking about senses. That's really important. Um, what, what other traits, um, like what would their bodies be like as I do a little body roll? There's a couple oh, different please. things. Sorry. There's a couple different things that you, besides the darkness and the food, like um, dealing with the cold and the pressure would be another thing that we'd have to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you want to travel between heat sources. Um, so there's a number of different adaptations that different animals have, at least in the fish and marine mammal world. So they have different um, proteins that keep their blood from freezing. Mm -hmm. um, and then marine mammals will have tons and tons of lipids to um, keep themselves, you know, warm enough and they have different types of uh, circulation. And then there's that also called blubber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Which is actually a lot of the polar food webs are based around the transfer of lipids. So it's like slightly different than, um, food webs that you find closer, closer to the equator. And then the other thing that also would be dealing with the pressure, right? So if our, um, systems are based down at the bottom where the heat sources are, um, the organisms will have to deal with pressure. And I'll let Sarah talk about how invertebrates do that. I don't actually know how that is, but I know that there are some fish that they find at depth that have uh, these proteins that are, I think, I don't know how to pronounce it because I've only ever read it, but I think it's called piezolites um, that actually help them tolerate the intense pressure that they feel at depth when they're found by these vents. That's so cool. That is cool. Um, so basically, the, the one great way of getting around a, a huge pressure situation is just don't have any air in your body whatsoever. <laughs> if you've got air in your body, it's not going to go great if you're changing pressure a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think probably swim bladders are something that, that uh, fish have that help with buoyancy. They're out the window. We're not dealing with those. Um, yeah, I can't have those. <laughs> can't have those. It's just not going to work out. And then I think if we're dealing with um, like 
uh, one hydrothermal vent and then a lot of incredibly cold, incredibly high pressure water, um, we probably are going to have animals that are incredibly like adaptable between different temperatures. Mm -hmm. So um, one, there's, there's these really, a really cool adaptation that octopuses have um, called RNA editing. And so basically, you know, you've got your DNA strand and then the RNA is uh, the copy that actually codes for the protein that you're going to end up making. And so um, cephalopods on the whole are very adaptable in their RNA because they can get the RNA copy and then futz around with it a little bit using these other proteins called ADARs that basically say, okay, today I need this particular protein to be a little bit more suited for this situation as opposed to this situation. That's incredibly anthropomorphized, but you know what I'm saying. Like there are different uh, isoforms to different situations. And so there's this one octopus that um, was one of the, like the first examples where we showed this was happening because when you put it in cold water, you'd get one type of protein. Um, and then when you put it in warmer water, you get the same protein, but different basically. Ooh. And so if wow. that's what you have, if you have to have an animal that's going from pretty hot water around a hydrothermal vent to incredibly cold back to incredibly hot, maybe these animals um, might have proteins with shorter lifespans, but that you're pumping out all the time. So you can quickly like switch your method um, mm. for different, different things that you need. Amazing. That's really that, cool. <laughs> does that like change how, like if you're able, I get uh, I want it to be more dramatic than it is, probably. <laughs> we can make it super dramatic in our, in our life. Yeah, well, sure, we're making it our world. world, so let's, let's go. Let's see I'm it. sure, like, in octopuses, it is, like, they, it's just happening inside them, like, how we oxidize blood or whatever. But, right. like, what I want it to be is, is like, a costume change. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, well, octopuses are doing co costume changes, right. literally constantly so that that can scratch that itch for you uh yeah. it does do that um but yeah i mean they're, they're probably not doing it consciously it's just there's a system that tells the the rna hey it's time to change our tune here yeah, yeah. Very uh, cool. i would love for us to get weird and creative and kate i know you've seen a lot of poorly drawn pictures of whales <laughs> so i wonder if you've seen anything in these pictures that we know are totally wrong here on earth, but might give us some inspiration for a weird thing we can add to our life form here. Yes, absolutely. Um, such a strange twist of fate that this is <laughs> why I'm called into podcast now. <laughs> um, so years ago, I worked as a uh, tour guide at many museums around the country, and I became really fascinated with um, drawings of like scientific drawings of whales from the 17 and 1800s um, because in the 17 and 1800s science was a really flexible term which didn't really mean anything <laughs> um, and so uh, scientific drawings of whales would be basically like someone who had seen a whale would describe it to someone who could draw and was interested in science and they would draw what someone had described to them and they would be like science it's a whale this is what it is put it in a book and so there's so many drawings of whales and they're beautiful like ornate like they're really amazing drawings but they're very incorrect <laughs> in terms of whales <laughs> like um and they're often like you know if someone might have seen a whale or a sea creature and decided it was a sea monster and so described a sea monster and was like that's a whale that's what's out there um and people were really terrified of the ocean and like what was under the ocean and there was all this stuff about like hell maybe is under the ocean because we don't know what's there and it might be hell i don't know um there yeah <laughs> that's um a and the, place. right and then the only other way that people could occasionally actually see a whale if they were not whalers um was if a, a whale died and and like came up it washed up on the beach um and they would actually because it was such a strange thing they would like have carnivals on top of the whale so um <laughs> on the whale yeah i could oh. okay, i'll i'll send you some stuff that sounds uh, really smelly it does yeah but i think everything was smelly then so <laughs> um but they there's literally drawings of like a like a like a big top set up like on top of a whale and then people just like in a line like walking on top of the whale and like um people were like cooking parts of the whale on a little stove it's insane but anyway 
obviously what happens to a whale when it has been like rotting at sea for a long time and been eaten by things and then washes up and continues to bloat. That's not actually like what a whale looks like. Um, so I don't know if this is helpful to this discussion, but um, one of my favorite <laughs> parts of these drawings is um, the, the whale penis is always, so like when it washes up on shore and it's bloated, um, whales have really long penises, obviously, um, but usually they're like tucked into a little pouch, I think is the scientific term for it. <laughs> um, but then all of yeah. the polite <laughs> whales use their penis pouch. Yes, exactly. Um, but when they bloat, uh, it sort of like spills out. Um, and it sometimes it's like kind of like a loose sock. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's all of these like drawings of whales with like kind of their tongues sticking out and then like really long, like loose penises coming out. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my favorite. One of my favorite elements of these drawings uh, that people were like, science whales have giant big floppy dicks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I I recently it was the episode that came out um, a couple of days ago. I did an episode with Kyle Marion, who's a former physical anthropologist, and she brought up that a common discussion uh, in physical anthropology is genital size and how it relates to social structures. And I promised her that I would start off my next exolore discussion with. So how big do we think their genitals are? You're welcome. There we go. I've done that for you. So <laughs> how big do we think their genitals are? Hmm. I mean, it's a big open ocean. <laughs> well, we can look to the barnacles. Uh, they have incredibly long penises. That's that's one. Uh, comparable one. to their size, not like. Comparable to their size. Genitals. But yeah, that's, that's because true. they like, they can't move. So if they're right. going to reproduce, they would need to have these long things that can. Exactly. So I think the, the penis size is going to be very dependent on how much you're moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if everybody Yes, are like, we going to have people, are we going to have things moving? I think. I, I think so, yeah. I mean, that was part of why they need to be able to adjust temperatures if they're moving from hot spring right. to non-hot spring or hot mm -hmm. then. I feel, yeah, and I think if, if we're later going to talk about culture, I think it's pointless to talk about culture if nobody's moving. Or because, super isolated cultures. Right. But <laughs> right. if everybody's just like stay and put forever, then culture is just, uh, <laughs> doesn't really matter. Well, the other thing too is that uh, things would have to move a lot. We haven't really talked yet about hydrothermal vents, but they have a limited uh, lifespan, right? Oh, so they don't last forever. Right. Um, so eventually things would have to move. Um, if they don't have some way of dispersing for reproduction, they would have to move from vent system to vent system. So it could be almost some sort of like nomadic or vision fusion kind of society. What's the time scale of that? Is it like many generations can use the same hydrothermal vent or is it like, oh, it's another month I have to move again? I Within don't a actually. scale of decades. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so some fast. animals will have multiple generations. Um, Probably most of the animals that I'm thinking of that live in hydrothermal vents on Earth are going to have multiple generations for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not like tens of generations if, if we're thinking of uh, organisms that are living as long as humans do. Okay. Great. So Plus just I wonder to, if, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I wonder if there are things that they need that are outside of the like thermal vent area that they have to like gather or um, go on treks. Mm -hmm. to get these things. Yeah, because yeah, you're going to have a lot of like the same stuff at a hydrothermal vent, like that sulfurous stuff, right? But maybe like broadly in the ocean that we're working with, there's going to have a lot of something else, like some kind of mineral you need that's been totally covered up by this hydrothermal vent schmutz. And so you got to go outside, grab your stuff, bring it back to home, and then work with it. Okay, this relates very closely um, to a really fascinating book that I just read. Uh, I'm at my boyfriend's parents' house, and uh, it's not the house he grew up in, but they saved a lot of, like, his stuff. Uh, and I found uh, the very first Animorphs book. Whoa. <laughs> Do you, I'm look, I don't know where it is right now, but. Um, yes. It has like a kid turning into a lizard on the front, uh, and it has like flip. Uh, if you flip the corners, it's got like a little flip book in it, in a real like innovative move for a book. Um, 
And I started reading it out loud to him as a joke. And then I was like, oh shit, now I have to finish reading. <laughs> so I read the whole book and um, I must have read these when I was a kid, but I like don't remember them at all. Um, and the whole plot is that these aliens, there's aliens uh, that have come to earth and they're like slugs that crawl into people's brains and control them. And um, then there's an, another race of, of aliens that are trying to save people and they give them the power to morph into animals. That part's not important, but- uh, That sounds these, very important to the plot of the yeah. <laughs> To the plot, but not for our discussion. But these <laughs> alien, these um, the alien slugs that live in your brain are called Yerks and um, they can only live in your brain for three days and then they have to go to a Yerk pool um, to like gather essential nutrients that are not available on earth um to like soak that back up for like ha an hour and then they have to and then they can crawl back into your brain um, oh so i wonder if it's something like that where it's like they can live at the hydrothermal vents and they have everything that they need but like every so often there's like a nutrient or a yeah we can totally like relate this yeah <laughs> i think so we there's can implement this. at hydrothermal vents there's um i mean the most frequent example that you see in most things is that there's this symbiotic relationship between bacteria and worms where the worms can eat the bacteria and the bacteria can oxidize the sulfide that's in the system um, and that's how they make energy and we could totally make this a parasitic situation instead where it's living inside something and taking advantage and then traveling <laughs> far maybe it could anamorph into some sort of uh, a squid situation well, yeah, what if there's what did you say that it was bacteria that can um yeah, so, I, and I've, I know that there are some symbiotic or, like, parasitic situations where, like, the, the uh, an, an animal will basically, like, gather certain kinds of bacteria that perform a job for it, and so, like, they, I guess that's symbiosis then, um, so they're just, and then, yeah, if these animals had that bacteria on them and then could go to the thermal vents where, like, the bacteria could do its work, mm. but maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what they need to leave for, but. Yeah, so it's typically like, it's it's symbiotic in that the animal can, the animal that the bacteria is living inside can sort of regulate the flow of nutrients and stuff that get to the bacteria. And sometimes they'll even eat the bacteria or the energy from, and then the um, bacteria are chemoautotrophs, so they can produce energy from the chemicals in the water rather than photoautotrophs, which is what we're used to seeing, which is mm. taking the light and producing it into energy instead. Um, so you could do that, and then I don't know what you would need. I guess m maybe more space, or what would be like a limiting resource in this? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm picturing these hydrothermal vents almost like watering holes. Um, yeah. And uh, people can gather at the watering hole, and they can spend time there. But if a if a predator comes by, like you're going to scatter. And I I like the idea of us thinking about all of these different creatures that would exist on this world and how their schedules like play or interplay with the schedule of like this this dominant kind of apex predator in this environment. Ooh, what does the apex predator lo look like? Yeah. So what that yeah, so this if this is the <laughs> dominant thing. Let's let's focus on that um, and start thinking about the traits that would just lead you to be, beat everyone. Everyone. There's well, I think that I am picturing that lives uh, near like oil rigs, like very deep in the ocean. It's called the uh, magna pinna or the or the the big fin squid or the long arm squid, depending on who you ask. But basically, they're about person sized ish, and they have uh, very very long tendrily arms that like hang down from their regular suction cup arms, and they're about eight meters long, and they're just they kind of look like they have an elbow. So it's like Squid face, and then just eight <laughs> eight elbows, and each elbow's got this eight meter long dangler. And so maybe our big predator, like you may not see the predator right away because he's eight meters away, dangling his danglers. And then maybe like the danglers also are very good at um, I don't know. Let's say that they're covered in mucus, okay? Because we don't want anyone to smell that the predator's around because that's important. And they're very mm. fine danglers uh, that go with the flow because you don't want anybody to feel that you're around. You gotta be a real stealth 
predator, not necessarily visually, but on all of these other aspects of, of uh, sensory organs that we we're working with. Mm -hmm. So we're going with the flow so you can't feel them. You're covered in mucus so you can't smell them. Much like um, parrotfish, when they sleep, they cover themselves in a big slime ball so that they can't be smelled. Um, and so that's also what I hereby declare our big predator is doing. Um, <laughs> yes. And so when our predator bumps that dangler into uh, our whatever is living there, that's when it'll grab on and pull it up like the claw uh, from uh, Toy Story. Yes. Oh, I love I it. Think our, I think our predator should also be able to detect heat because it will be able to find the hydrothermal vents that way. And um, I can't remember why, but I know it must be the chemical processes that are happening, but hydrothermal vents also give off like a dim bioluminescence, um, which I think they should be able to detect too. I agree. Well, mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Okay, Ooh, great. And that means if you introduce Luminous. light, then, you, then you're introducing all kinds of stuff like, um, like the, People, like uh, creatures that can sense light better would maybe do better in certain situations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I love that. Awesome. All right, so it's called the Magna Pena. Is that what you said? Magna Pena, P I N N A. Magna Pena. All right, so that's what we're basing our, our like powerful dominant species on. Uh, and they can't spend all of their time at the hydrothermal vents because then none of the other creatures that they presumably eat would never go there and they wouldn't have a source of food. So there's like some migration to and away from the hydrothermal vents for everyone. Sarah, uh, Cecilia, what did, what did you have to say? Yeah, okay, so I just thought too, um, our predator, so presumably there's variation in the thickness of this ice and there, I've decided that there is. Um, yeah. And the, uh, there's, so there's a lot of seals, like Weddell seals that use their teeth to dig through the ice to create air pockets. So I think that our really super large predator would be able to have some sort of teeth or something hard, some calcium hard surface that allows them to dig through the ice so they could hide at the surface as well. Yes. I just uh, started rewatching Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love the idea of them being able to like hide and maybe preserve themselves in the surface ice sheet. Ooh, that's awesome. Great. Uh, any last thoughts on this before we move on to a, a different thing? I like our predator. Me too. Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's let's start thinking about how the predator, like how might reproduction work for this predator, which will give us some really interesting, a really interesting foundation to then think about like their family unit and how that aspect of culture works. Uh, so is is there like do all squids reproduce in the same way? The transfer of sperm is wildly different between different squid species. Uh, some is quite violent, some is lovely and straightforward um, and not violent at all. Um, and, but they are all, in, in all cases that I can think of off the top of my head right now, you've got the transfer of sperm to the female. She can store it for however long uh, is appropriate for her species, sometimes like up to a month or more, but sometimes like days. Um, it kind of depends on, uh, the species and 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 the availability of sperm um and so then she goes to lay a clutch of eggs this can come in many different forms depending on what kind of squid you are um but then uh the clutch of eggs can have varying numbers like thousands and thousands or like 20. um and then they develop from eggs sometimes the eggs are left on the bottom of the seafloor sometimes they're carried around with mom um now in terms of our predator squid, I just feel like changing the temperature of eggs is going to be hard. Um, and there are some species of, uh, of cephalopods, specifically these uh, deep sea octopuses, that will go without eating for four and a half years while her eggs develop, um, which is wild. She doesn't move. She doesn't eat. She doesn't do anything but take care of her eggs for four and a half years. Um, and while they're developing. Now, I think <laughs> our squid probably should carry eggs with her. I don't think mm -hmm. she should be leaving them on the seafloor somewhere because it's either going to be way too cold or way too hot. Mm -hmm. So she may just do like circles. Since she's the apex predator, we don't have to worry too much about things attacking her. 
So um, I was, could, I was, yeah, things could eat the eggs. So she definitely wouldn't want to leave the eggs. them. You don't want to leave them somewhere. Although yeah. there are um, bacteria that protect squid eggs and make them generally like not great eaten. Mm -hmm. um, so generally squid eggs that are left on the seafloor don't get eaten too much. But I'm imagining mama squid, she's carrying all of her eggs with her. And there are many squid species that live in the deep sea. that You'll just see like carrying a bunch of eggs around with them. And so I'm thinking she's doing an orbit around the uh, hydrothermal vent to be in that like Goldilocks temperature for squid egg development. Nice. Um, or read... would it be, or would it be like a, like a March of the Penguins situation where mama stays in one place or dad uh, and the other one goes and like gets food and maybe comes back, maybe doesn't. That's totally possible too. Um, Given that we're not strictly required to make the squid a squid, this is a uh, space <laughs> right. squid, we can absolutely have a mishmash of organisms. So yeah, maybe she stays in that orbit so dad always knows where she is mm -hmm. and then can do a quick zoop, zoop, zoop around the orbit to be like, where's mom? Have a crab or what have you. And then, uh, and then go back to hunting. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I read about a month ago that a lot of squid species die after they reproduce and that it is in somehow related to like hormones that are tied to the optic nerve or like something there. Because I, I, this study may have been completely bunk, but it looked kind of legit um, where they tried removing this specific nerve and then squids lived longer after they reproduced. Um, and I feel like this because it's the optic nerve, I think it'd be really fun if this, if uh, our apex predator was blind, even though there is some light uh, down at the bottom. Um, and so they have that disadvantage because they can't see, but other things can, but it does let them live longer. I'm totally on board with that. Some like squid in, species um... can reproduce repeatedly and it's no big deal, but oh, okay. yeah, that's, uh, that sounds good. Like the thing in Pan's Labyrinth? That, that lives in a tree, I think. It has the like eyes on its hands, but it doesn't really see. It just smells. Oh, yeah. So creepy. So creepy. <laughs> <laughs> like definitely gave me nightmares as a kid. <laughs> oh yeah, it was super creepy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So if if that's how they reproduce, they the um, moms carry the eggs with them and circle in this predetermined location so the dads can come find them. What does that mean for um, how, like family relationships or maybe gender roles. You draw on marine mammals a little bit here. Um, I mean, there's all different structures, social structures in marine mammals that, um, you know, they're not necessarily carrying the eggs, but they're they stay, a lot of different marine mammals stay with their young um, and they develop these pods where, you know, there's these matriarchal situations where, you know, grandmothers and mothers um, and non-related um, other females in the system are all, they all stay together and protect their young together. Um, and then you have other situations where you go off in pairs. Um, and some of them, we call them uh, fission fusion societies where mm -hmm. they have their little groups, but they come back to the big group together and they sometimes remix and then they'll go back out again. So they have sort of like a home base, but they, you know, keep going back in and out so you have a situation like that um and then there's all sorts of like communications within those systems where they have um you know songs that are used for communication that are culturally transmitted from generation to generation um so i think all those things you could draw on particularly yeah. if this is a long-lived species that's amazing the the um big point for matriarchal societies is um lineage is never, it, lineage always goes, uh, in humans anyway, uh, in like old um, matriarchal societies, um, it just made more sense for uh, lineage to be based, in, based on like the mother, mm -hmm. because like you always know, if you're a mother, like you know it's your kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't mess that up. <laughs> and this is the whole, this is why patriarchy like makes no sense, is because it's like, well, you're never sure. <laughs> And so much violence in the world is just because men have been like, wait, is it my kid? Like, are we sure? Women are like, I, I'm sure. I know it's my kid. I, I, I know it. Uh, so <laughs> um, that's one really 
good strength. I don't know when you mix eggs into the equation. I don't know if that changes, but um, I I love the idea of like squid matriarchs uh, orbiting, like traveling in a, in a loop. Yes. I love that. One, One thing that this makes me think of is a process where all of the women who have eggs will circle in the same loop. Um, and there's a chance that like their men folk, when they go off to get food and bring it back, might die. But if they maneuver it so that um, the men folk, when they come back, can't tell which eggs are theirs, they'll just give food to all of the the pregnant yeah, with the love who are collective orbit. Collective survival. And the women strategy. would never tell. Exactly. No. <laughs> now, there's an important thing about squid in that many squid species will uh, have fewer females than males generally. And the male, the females will mate with many males during mating season. And then even within one clutch of eggs have different fathers from different, um, for different eggs. And so this actually makes perfect sense because as long as a male has mated with anybody, it's in his best interest to feed everybody Mm -hmm. because so many, as long as you baited with one of the females, you know, feed them. Such a happy world. Oh, I love this. <laughs> this makes me really happy. Um, all very, right. very takes a village. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, this is switching gears a little bit. What do we think their general outlook on life might be? We we just talked about uh, like the birthing cycle, but what about death? Are they afraid of it? Do they welcome it? Do they hate it? Like what what's going on? What do we think? Ooh, well, we think of, we talk about death a lot in terms of like darkness and like going towards the light. I wonder if for them, it's more about temperature, if it's more about like getting cold or, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, losing warmth. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. And I think like there should be some sort of thought about like giving back, like the cycle of it all. Cause you're already cycling, like circling over things. Mm-hmm. You're cycling back between the hydrothermal vent and your, your orbit back and forth, back and forth. Like, and all of your life comes from this one place. So I don't know. I would imagine there would be kind of like a great circle of life kind of uh, approach toward thinking mm-hmm. about um Death. Ooh. I wonder if there are, if they have uh, any conceptual ideas about what's past the ice. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially if they, uh, we talked a bit earlier about them being able to burrow into it. Mm-hmm. Um, that can be a survival strategy, but it can also be turned into something that becomes a religious passage or rite. Like to see how far the, uh, you can get into like the steeples. It. Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> and I think all of this would be a perfect thing to have um, as a storytelling society, right? Because we can still have sound. Um, and we know that there's lots of animals in the ocean that have, uh, you know, sounds that they pass on and sounds that they change and Mm -hmm. um have different you know sort of like flows like classical music where it has different sections that they change um as generations pass by which you could totally tell this epic story that you've created (laughs) in that format and and singing yeah and especially if they're a group i wonder if they sing together yeah Yeah, like um those animals that uh sing in chorus so there's all sorts of different like frogs and other um uh, dolphins that have a uh, chorus singing that, you know, is the topic of lots of behavioral studies, but I'm not sure that anyone fully understands it, whether it's an actual sort of method of communication or if it's just a way to form bonds between individuals or what, but yeah. It yeah. makes me think that like their version of high school glee club would be almost <laughs> as, uh, or like maybe even more uh, popular than like jocks. For like football players. <laughs> um, what might their, so if they, they like this, this um, cyclical, they have the cyclical view of uh, nature and it seems like they would be very okay with their body then returning uh, to nature. Um, so that, because that means the rest of their community will benefit from it. 
So how would they honor that step in the process? Uh, would funerals and burial rites be really elaborate because they're grateful that this uh, once living form is going to be giving back to the community in this new way? Or do they do these rituals not exist because um, like this is just something that you're expected to do, it shouldn't be celebrated? I would think it would be like a funeral pyre out on the Viking ship type situation where they like maybe drop the body on top of the animals that they're then going to eat so that you know you're kind of fertilizing your uh food source for sure it'd be like a, a whale fall ceremony right you right, have all these exactly. like desert areas in the ocean um and then you suddenly have a whale that dies and falls to the the bottom of the ocean and it's completely completely overrun with different types of um, marine animals in different stages that I could see that becoming part of this process where mm -hmm. maybe they even use their hole that they dug out with their teeth to get to the surface. Yeah. Maybe they also erect a, a big top uh, over it and have a carnival <laughs> <laughs> the dead body. I, I would think that if they are kind of a, if the core group of these animals is like moving, of these, these creatures uh, is, is always about moving and like keeping in motion, maybe part of recognizing a death is like stopping for a little while. Um, and I think like elephants do this where they'll like pause their migration uh, and basically have a funeral. Oh, that's really beautiful. That, sounds, that makes total sense, yeah. <laughs> Love that. Um, what might their art be like? We've, we've talked a lot about singing. Are there other art forms that they would develop or, or really appreciate? Would it have to be sensory, right? Because right. they're not visual. So yeah, I wonder if it's maybe. like if the hair is temperature based or like maybe, maybe smell, based. smell based. Yeah, what if 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 there was a way to like if they're very sensitive to temperature and like feeling how the water is moving, if there are ways to like move warm water and cold water into each other in like beautiful ways that they can sense. <laughs> okay, so if we're working with That's a cool. squid, you've got the ability to take a lot of water in and then hold it. So if they swim down to where it's warmer, take a deep breath in, hold it in their bodies, and then instead Whoa. of just propulsioning back to where they were, flap, flap, flapping, because squid have the ability <laughs> to flap or squirt, basically. <laughs> and so um, they can take a deep breath, hold it in, and then together be moving that temperature and like basically dance meets something we don't have um, like uh like what's that what's that um oh, i used to have one of these when i was a kid no it's like spin art where oh, it's like a, yeah. a table that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Like squirt water <laughs> yeah right that's great <laughs> great um what about maybe like rites of passage how would what would be the different stages of life and how would you know, how would you signal that you have advanced to the next stage? I think a big rite of passage here would be choosing the vent that you go to, because I think that in a lot of hydrothermal vent situations, you've got a dispersal. Um, and this is also true of squid, like where you have this stage of life where you're ultra, ultra tiny, and you're just floating in the current or whatever, looking for, um, a place to live. Um, and so maybe, you know, all those babies go forth and some of them might end up back in the little society that they started in, or they might up, end up in the next vent over. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so getting to the vent would be the first major step after hatching. Um, moving day. Moving day, <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. It makes, like, we've, we've talked about how they have really tight-knit communities but mm -hmm. if there's this initial dispersal that means that these tight-knit communities that they love and protect are communities that they chose right that's nice yeah. um well, well and it and it leads to genetic diversity so that's good right yes always a good thing it's sentimental and practical <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh what other uh, stages would there be like sexual maturity I feel like there has to be, especially if these are, um, they're not always family um, groups, there has to be some, it, all of these like females that are forming the like core group, there have to be some kind of like bonding ceremonies 
um, to, to make sure that to, to make it cohesive and to, and mm -hmm. to like make it kind of official that they're part of the group. Yes. Maybe as your like uh, coming of age ceremony, you need the, the males and the females both like as a group work together to put together one of those art pieces. Um, mm -hmm. So every year in let's say spring, uh, we're probably not going to have seasons because everything is kind of right. working, you know, but right. like what, at a certain time of year or, or developmental cycle, um, all the males, all the females do this dance, this sensory water temperature dance um, to, cause that you got to work together to be able to make a piece of art together. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the, I, I feel like Kate, you were getting towards the, like the bonds just between the women and the community. Like what, right. what can they have that's special to them? Yeah. I mean, it has to be some kind of like sharing thing. Some, some, mm -hmm. maybe some sacrifice you make for the group, some, mm -hmm. um, something you give up. I don't know yeah. if, if there's like, I, I, well, and because may, if, if we're thinking that part of the survival tactic of this group, like this sort of setup is, um, that the, the males can't really tell the females apart. <laughs> um, I wonder if like they are kind of born with individual markings, uh, but then they like give them the, the females like give them up to, mm be able to like make this survival strategy work and, and become part of a group. Yeah, that's, I like that. Another thing I thought of was maybe a big hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they go out and they hunt together and bring food back for the men. And it's like, well, we're feeding you now because we expect mm -hmm. you to feed us later when we're- Because you feed us forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are also, um, like in penguins and uh, I guess some dolphins that have uh, sort of like unique vocalizations that the mother and calf or the mother and chick can identify. Um, they can identify each other, but nobody else necessarily recognizes it, um, mm -hmm. which is also another thing that could be established. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, Sarah, you, you brought something up in passing about like seasons. But mm -hmm. I, I think you're right. They probably there wouldn't be seasons here, at least not in the way yeah. that we think of them here on land on Earth. Right. Um, so how do we think they would perceive or measure the passage of time? Like what what natural things around them would they use to keep regular intervals in check? I wonder if each community would have its own clock, because like you you need everybody to be breeding at the same time to have this like everybody growing up at the same time that kind of seasonality of things even if the temperature doesn't change even if your food source doesn't change but like your life cycle effectively would determine that but like what are your environmental cues based on that i don't know and how would that relate to when your vent dies basically mm -hmm. when it stops producing um so that could be our passage of time. Yeah. I mean, maybe I short term time doesn't variable. matter. Maybe. But like, mm -hmm. if you have a constant production of babies ocean wide um, and constant recruitment ocean wide, like, I, I guess some the ones that are latecomers will have to just decide whether they're in group one, like the older group that's going to mature quicker or the beginning of the next cohort effectively. Mm. Um, and I don't know how that would be determined. Um, is that something you can choose? The ocean. Can, can um, so like, some squid will, will get uh, sexually mature faster than others. Um, and why that is, I don't know, but um, some of them just like, they're, they're better at hunting, they get more food, they kind of reach the size where they're like, all right, I'm ready effectively. Mm -hmm. So and temperature can have a huge effect on um, how quickly they grow, how um, quickly the eggs develop as well. So if you know that you're in the beginning of the cohort, maybe those groups, like the beginning of the cohort went, goes to a colder area um, to slow down their development. And then when it comes time to like kick it into gear, or if you're at the end of your cohort, you're generally gonna be pushed more to the center mm -hmm. um, of this uh, circle. Um, so that would be one way of, of controlling how quickly you grow. Um, 
yes, there'd be ways of doing that. Word. Cool. And I also guess it's not like their body becomes sexually mature and then they have to act on it immediately. Like there's right. a time. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we're almost at the end of the hour. So do any of you have any last thoughts, things that we didn't touch on that you'd, you'd like to talk about now? I feel like I don't know how the males in this society, like, uh, like what they're doing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there. <laughs> do well, we care? I think uh, gaining access to mating is is challenging for, for many species, for birds, for, for squid, for, for lots of things. So I think during their youth, they need to be, be the best artists they could possibly be for their grand dance, because that is when the females are gonna be like, okay, that one did a great job. That one was off time, that one was really horrible. And you know, however they're deciding because their, their, their youth is all about getting strong and effective at art. And then once they're mating age, they need to be uh, mating as effectively as possible during that time period. Um, and then it's just food, food, food for the ladies. It's like, you're hunting, that's your job. Um, yeah. I wonder if some of that, if it, I mean, if those are three like very different skills, I wonder if like some of them are popular at some points, some of them are popular at other points. Like maybe Almost the ones that definitely. are- really good at art turn out to be like very bad at hunting and so like they get kind of like pushed aside for the the, the females end up having like other favorites <laughs> it's possible yeah. yeah and then what are the ones who don't end up mating what do they do yeah we just if it's a collective them? society it's like too bad <laughs> too bad buddy you gotta do it yeah, yeah I there, it's i'm sure that there are other things right like defense or yes um well if there's I, an apex predator what would they be defending against you're right. That's bacterial a good point. Infection. <laughs> bacterial infection. Um, yeah, doctors. Doctors. Yeah. I mean, if this is an advanced enough civilization, right. which it can become over enough time, um, they'll have other pursuits. This, this is actually what I wanted to mention as my last point. Uh, we only talked about like biological functions that are necessary. Yeah. We didn't talk about any any recreational stuff or or you know things that they do not because they have to, but because they want to. Uh, and so I, I bet they race, they have like uh, racetracks for the small creatures around the fence. And they bet on it. The longest racetrack ever. <laughs> <laughs> we could also just uh, copy some fish species and move completely to asexual reproduction and not have this situation at all. <laughs> mm, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Are there gay squids? <laughs> um, great question. So there are deep sea squid called Octopotuthus delatron that will, males will mate with males, but, but mostly they're, the, they're one of the violent maters. And so mm. when, they're very infrequently encountering another squid. And so when a male squid has the opportunity to mate with another squid, the way they do it is basically by grabbing the other squid by the torso effectively and then taking this like sharp tentacle that they have and shoving sperm straight through the body cavity and sticking it on the wall on the inside. And they'll do that with males or females um, because any squid they get, they're gonna take that opportunity. Um, I hate that. It's nasty. It's That's not horrible. what you want. Um, so, th that's a thing that happens. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't want to end not on that. Nice. It's not <laughs> nice. I, um, so we shouldn't end on that because yeah. It's, it's Ooh, I have one. I bet there are very pleasant practices of getting warm water like for art, but then like bathing each other in it. I love oh. that. Ooh. I love that. Yeah, like um, that. That would be so nice. Wouldn't yeah, we'll cool? stop. That's very nice. I bet that. I bet they do that. Okay, so <laughs> so some roles that we see happening once they move beyond the survival stage are like masseuse. Sure. Um, <laughs> a scientist, maybe like a doctor. 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 That's yeah. Sure. Um, I I love the idea of there being religious leaders, but eventually also like tour guides taking people to the upside down ice mountains 
Oh. And, and whether it's a, like a, a religious experience or a sacred journey or something. Like a, like a squid eat, pray, love. <laughs> <laughs> or even maybe like a sports arena. Like maybe that's where the upside down sports happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're taking like something that would float and that's the like ball in this situation and you can like shoot it in directions with your siphon you know that's possible yeah so we definitely need scientists to deal with some buoyancy issues then that's right mm -hmm. that's right absolutely um cecilia any last thoughts i don't know i don't know if i can top that last bit <laughs> all right um well hopefully you'll continue to think about this world uh although it kind of sounds very similar to the worlds that uh, Cecilia and Sarah inhabit, like in their jobs. So. I don't know, man. I'm I fully plan yeah. on a, a a traveling caravan of women who disguise themselves so the men have to feed them. Personally, <laughs> I think what I need to take out of this is that I need to be in a lazy river, just like <laughs> lounging, mm. being fed by men. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah. I want to be perfect. in an inner tube in the sun, you know getting fed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've basically replicated Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what happens in Antarctica? Oh, yeah. Isn't, didn't you know that? <laughs> that yeah. <laughs> Every time I've gone to count penguins in Antarctica, this is exactly what happens. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm missing out, apparently. Wow. <laughs> Well-kept secret. Okay. Uh, that is a much better note to end on. Yeah. So um, if our viewers or listeners want to learn more about you, how can they do that? And what would they be learning about? Uh, and I'll go in reverse order. So Kate, how can people find um, more about you? Yes, uh, I am at Kate Helen Downey on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can also follow at caveat NYC on Twitter and Instagram. Um, go to caveat.nyc to see all of our upcoming live streams. Um, we have one coming up, I think June 5th or 10th. I forget what the date is. What is it, Sarah? It's 5th. June 5th is a, a really amazing show called Blood in the Water. Out, this, this episode is coming out two weeks from yesterday. Is that, so that's after that's, June 5th. That's after June 5th, yeah. Never mind, edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, go to caveat.nyc and you can see all kinds of amazing lineups. Um, and Sarah makes an appearance pretty, pretty regularly. <laughs> yep. And so does Moya, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I love Caveat. This was a, a show with Caveat at yes. one point. That's how it, it was born. Um, great. Thank you for that, Kate. Yeah. Cecilia, what about you? How can people learn about what you're doing? Uh, yeah, sure. If you want to learn more about what um, I do or the research I do, or occasionally I do some SciComm, um, and I talk about oddball or ocean organisms on my Twitter page, which is Gonzo Scientist one um, and that's probably where I interact with people the most. Occasionally I'll go on Skype a scientist too. So if you request an oceanographer, uh, you can sometimes get me. <laughs> Word. And Sarah, what about you? You can find me and learn all about squid all the time at Sarah with an H, Sarah Mac attack. So that's S-A-R-A-H-M-A-C-K attack on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Although I'm, I live on Twitter, on Twitter, on Twitter all the time, <laughs> and on the others only like a couple times a day. And uh, you can learn more about Skype a Scientist, which you should definitely check out. It is free for everybody um, and just an awesome resource that everyone should take advantage of. That's skypeascientist.com. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter at Skype Scientist um, or Instagram at Skype a Scientist. Um, yeah, it's everywhere you can follow me and what I do. Great. And in case you didn't get any of those spellings or anything, uh, I'm linking to all of those pages down in the description. So you can go there to find more about our amazingly talented and brilliant guests. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have. If, if you continue to live in this world, uh, this imaginary world that we've just created, and you want to make some art featuring this world, I would absolutely love to see it. Uh, share it with the hashtag Exolore and I'll check it out. Um, even if our guests want to create some art. I don't know if any of you consider yourselves artistic, but that'd be great. You don't want us to make art. <laughs> <laughs> um, Last, you can uh, share the art. picture of the beached whale with a, with a circus around it, and I'll tag Exolor so you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thanks again for lending me your, your time and your brains um, and your senses of humor. It was Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah seriously, yeah, thanks. Thank this you. was a lovely escape. <laughs> 
today. Yeah, it was fun. Try to offer. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again. And I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>